Welcome to Distribution Talk with Jason Bader, the show where we dive into the stories, struggles, and solutions from business owners and thought leaders in the wholesale distribution market. Hi, friends. Jason here. In this episode, I have the pleasure of speaking with David Gordon, founder of Channel Marketing Group and publisher of the newsletter Electrical Trends. David's firm focuses on research in both the manufacturing and distribution markets and then turns those insights into actionable strategy for clients. Although he tends to focus on the electrical and industrial markets, his insights bleed over to several other distribution verticals. It's always a pleasure to catch up with David, and I hope you enjoy the conversation. This episode is brought to you by Connected Peers, an online peer collaboration platform for distribution professionals. Let's face it, most managers don't have the opportunity to speak with their industry peers about common challenges in their departments. Sure, they might see each other at an annual conference, but that hardly provides any real relationship building or continuity. What if there was a forum to solve challenges with those in your same role? Well, now there is. The concept is simple. Purchasing managers meeting with purchasing managers, training managers meeting with training managers, marketing managers meeting with marketing managers, You get the idea. There are 10 unique role-based communities to choose from. These are monthly facilitated meetings all via Zoom. Ask questions and receive feedback from people who understand the challenges of your position. Isn't it time that you quit going it alone? To learn more and find your peers, visit us at www.connectedpeers.com. All right, David. Hey, welcome to Distribution Talk. Thank you for taking the time to be with me. Thank you. I'm looking forward to it. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, it's been fun. I mean, both you and I have been uh, kind of running around the consulting and advisory world now for a number of years. And uh, it's kind of nice for us to, to get to bounce things off each other and chat a little bit uh, more than passing in hallways and waving and asking how everybody's doing. Yeah, passing in hallways at some of these conferences that we don't go to anymore. <laughs> That's very true. Yes, yes. And, and although I do miss the stage, I don't miss the travel. And that's going to be a harsh reality when that all opens back up to that point again, you know, for us. I mean, it's like, wow, um, gosh, I got to get on that flight for six to eight hours to get to a 45 minute speaking gig. Sometimes that just doesn't make a lot of sense. But that's that's the life we chose. I've gone to some of the conferences just because that's kind of like business development. And it's going to be interesting the next few because of so many people who've retired in the industry during COVID or in some cases been let go. But a lot of the senior level people that I've known for 25 years have retired sometime this year or they've already told me end of the year, they're gone. So it's learning all of that replacement next gen of sometimes those people never went to the industry conferences. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they're going to have different ideas and expectations and you get to learn a whole new set of people there. That's really interesting. You said that it jogs my memory. I have seen more first generationers or at least senior generation deciding to hang up the cleats this year and passing it on to that next generation. You know, that's definitely something I've seen over the last six months is people deciding to make that choice. And I don't know how much of it was COVID inspired or COVID coincidental. You know, in the sense of those people were kind of at that age anyways. I think there's definitely, it was an accelerant, if anything. Maybe, you know, they weren't totally sure when they wanted to hang up the cleats or move on, but this was an accelerant. This said, well, this pushed me along. And, you know, I think for a lot of people, it has been an accelerant in changing a strategy or somewhere where they've wanted to go. Yeah, I think it changed some people's minds like that, too. I think with some of the people also, because these are long-termers with their companies, it may have also been, quote unquote, giving back to their company because the company may have been doing some cost cutting and maybe they decide to retire or take a package a little earlier and it helps keep someone else. I could see some of that happening too. Yeah, interesting. I would agree with you. I think that that, and, and I've seen that in some companies, actually, I was very close to that there were senior people that, you know, they were, they might have been even working part time at this point from a kind of a part time consulting basis. And they decided to, you know, step away or they, they made that concession really for the health of the organization during yep. challenging times. So, yeah, I definitely have seen that for sure. So, David, give us a little history lesson. How did you get involved with distribution and, and why do you stay in distribution? Well, 
I got involved from a pure distribution side, actually right out of school. My first job was with a company in the performance marketing, performance incentive industry, which is developing the frequent buyer programs, the incentives, the loyalties. Yeah. You know, a lot of distributors know yeah. them as frequent buyer programs and trips. And a good chunk of our business was in distribution. And I was in some internal roles there. And then when I got into sales, my first client was in the security alarm industry, a company called Aratech that was a okay. manufacturer distributor. My first pure distributor was a company in Connecticut called Capital Light and Supply, which was a $10 million company at the time. And then I also worked, did a project for Carol Cable, which is sold multiple times as a manufacturer. So just kind of started getting into that. And I spent probably the first yeah. eight, 10 years in that industry. And my client base was all manufacturers and distributors. And probably 70% mm -hmm. of it was construction and industrial trades. So through that career, I ended up having probably about a dozen distributors strictly in electrical. And we had also done building materials and plumbing and roofing materials and wall coverings, things like that. But then iMark, well, what became iMark, reached out to me at the request of one of their members. And I then became the VP of marketing and e-commerce for iMark. I was there for five years. I also was involved in supplier relations and membership recruitment. Then when I went to a dot-com back in 2000 that was started by Rockwell. And uh, mm -hmm. focused on national accounts, early days. We used plenty of manufacturer money, distributor money, missed round two financing. Learned mm -hmm. that e-commerce is all about volume because we had $140 million going through the system, but at a 3% gross margin. So Yeah, that's painful. That's painful. Yeah. Dot com becomes a dot com. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. We're not moving the kids. And uh, the mother of necessity is invention. Mm -hmm. So I started the consulting business. And 20 years later, we focus uh, our energies in uh, the industrial and construction trades. Mm -hmm. Probably about 80% of the business is electrical today. About 50-50, mm -hmm. depending on the year, manufacturer and distributor and do some stuff with reps. And we focus in the areas of strategy, market, market research, basically anything that can help companies gain information or develop strategies to help them accelerate profitable sales is really where our gotcha. special. Gotcha. And then 13 years ago, we also launched a blog called Electrical Trends. And I, I noticed, you know, I, I went and looked on that. I mean, how many articles do you have on there or how many actually blogs? I guess that's a better way to put it because it's not the thousand word article that we, we have to do for the magazine. Well, actually, most of them are probably about 700 to 1,000 words. Okay. Yep. Part of that is because Google likes longer text. And sometimes to get a good thought out there, you know, you just start writing there. But there's close to 1,200 yeah. postings out there. Yeah. Try yeah. to do one or two a week. Wow. That is, that's awesome. Some of them are tied strictly to the industry. Some of them are just thought leadership. Yeah. We kind of position it as, insights, observations, and information. And nice. there's over 3,000 people. Nice. Subscribe. I mean, no, that's great. That's longevity. I'll be honest with you. I've been writing, you know, for a long, a long time as well, you know, 17 years probably. And I'll be honest with you. I, I get to a point where I struggle to get one out every month. I just get tired of it. You know, sometimes you think, what am I going to talk about today? You know, what, what am I going to throw out there? And, and it's funny where those inspirations come from. It's a crack yeah. up, you know, where that stuff comes from sometimes. So, and, it, and it's nice to have be able to control your own editorial content and calendar. Oh, absolutely. Oh, trust me. Um, now, I, I don't mind sometimes, you know, I do send my, you know, my rough articles, you know, in these editors, and they make it, they make me sound really good. And I really like that part of the thing. They clean these things <laughs> yeah. up. And for a guy who never wrote uh, much in college or, you know, or, or previous studies to actually write published articles, trust me, there's a lot of editing and a lot of polishing on these things to make them uh, every once in a while, there's some creative license taken by that editor as well. And I'm, eh, I'm okay with that too. Years ago, I used to do a lot of writing for TED Magazine yeah, yeah. in electrical wholesaling, yeah. progressive distributor, industrial supply magazine, done some stuff for MDM. But that was based upon them saying, well, can you write about X? And they had their deadlines. Yes. 
Now, the good thing is back in the early days, a lot of times you got paid a little bit for it. Yeah. yeah that, that, when that stopped, <laughs> yeah. like, wait, do I want to be held to their schedule and their topic, or do I want to have self-control? And that's why I, when I went to the blog, and occasionally I'll still write for some of the others. Yeah, yeah. But the blog is easier. Yeah, that's so funny, David. I, I literally only got paid by one publisher for articles. Yeah, everything else, you know, they just expect it. And it was a Taiwanese publishing company and they would translate this into Chinese and they would translate it. And, uh, you know, they made the classic mistake of asking me how much for an article. And I just threw out a random number. I said, well, how about this? All of a sudden I would get these checks from the Bank of Taiwan for, well, okay. And that, that went for, you know, maybe a year or so. And it was pretty funny actually, but uh, yeah, nobody else pays for articles anymore. And uh, yeah, not anymore, but it's interesting. They won't pay us as experts to write, yeah. but they'll find freelance writers to call people to get interviews and pay yep. them. Yep. And I'll be honest, most of the time I'm very free with my time about it. I'm just like, okay, whatever, right. you know, I, I, I'm fine. And I kind of look at it this way. You're the freelance writers. I'm like, look, I know you guys aren't making a killing here. So, you know, I'm just gonna, I, I'm more than happy to contribute, you know? Um, yeah, I, don't, I don't mind sharing with them, but I find it interesting the publications will go to them yeah. when they want something that's an area of expertise from us. Yeah, yeah. Well, apparently their rate their rates a little better than we than ours, I guess, out there. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we have opinions. <laughs> yes, yes, we have opinions. So, you know, David, actually, if I could circle back here for a second, you know, you talked about the loyalty business for a minute, and um, I was a client of one of those out of Atlanta. Was that the same area you were in? No, I was in Boston. Oh, I okay. okay. I was in Boston and then worked for a company in Iowa, but we had clients all over the country. Gotcha. Okay. I just, it would have been very coincidental. I saw clients in that area where we help companies, we develop their rule structures and help manage that. And we'll yeah. put out, quote unquote, the RFP for someone else to implement just because I had so much background in that space already. So it becomes a, trusted consultant who's unbiased in the selection process and can develop the right strategy for the client mm -hmm. versus mm -hmm. a strategy that can optimize the rewards that get redeemed. So do you still see this as a, a an effective tool? It is effective, especially in the contractor space. Mm -hmm. It's evolving more to about customer engagement than the rewards especially because of COVID and obviously the travel part going away. The travel part, especially as group travel and especially in contractor-oriented distributors, really gets to the issue of socialized business because mm -hmm. it's relationship-oriented. So if you're going on a group trip, you have an opportunity for three, four, five days to strengthen that relationship. When it gets to merchandise and individual travel and certificates and stuff like that, it's more quote unquote trash and trinkets. Okay. And there's different ways to conceive how those programs can be pushed down from strictly ownership. Because ownership, do they really need another TV? Right. We both know that they'd really prefer to be into a rebate program. They'd prefer the cash, but they don't want to take the tax hit on it. So yep. there's some other ways that can be conceived. So it becomes more part of that overall contractor ship so that the project managers or the estimators could participate in things. And it's just a case yeah. of thinking of how think of how to structure that a little bit different. But performance in a travel related program is higher than performance in merchandise programs. Gotcha. Interesting. Yeah, that was one of the struggles. And again, I'm going back 20 plus years ago, you know, to think about this, but that was one of the big struggles is to get the reward in the hands of the right people. That was a tough one because, you know, sometimes the owner would, you know, want to hoard the points or hoard the, the reward. And really the people that the influence there were the superintendents, they were the um, project manager, they were the purchasing agent in many cases as well. And those were the people you'd rather influence along the way, but it, it was a touchy, it was a touchy relationship for sure. It's touchy there. I mean, I remember a strategy we did eons ago for Cisco. 
the food mm-hmm. service distributor. Yeah. And if you remember Cisco, I don't know how it's structured now, but back then was state specific. Okay. And it's difficult going in their scenario because the customers are institutions and restaurants and things like that. So we started coming up with reward systems that would tie to local charities, that would tie to giving people lunches, that would tie to uh, building improvements, things like that people could invest into themselves differently. And I've had other things where we do where it's going to be giving people a series of dinner certificates to give to their people. Interesting. That they okay. spend locally. One of the things we've talked to some distributors about because of COVID who want to do loyalty strategies, but get it to the people and want to have do good. I mean, we did a strategy years ago, right after Katrina down in New Orleans with a distributor where for every dollar purchase, people earned basically points that went towards donations to Children's Hospital in New Orleans. And we generated over a couple of hundred thousand dollars to give in the names of the contractors down there. But even with COVID now, we've talked about how do you do strategies tied to DoorDash and Grubhub? Yes. Because the biggest audience that's hurt yep. is all these restaurants. So if you give people a bunch of DoorDash certificates, and they can do them up to, I think, 200 bucks, maybe they'll give them to their people. And that money will then get spent in the local community. And it's a way of recycling the funds because that's an audience base. It's not a, you can't give to a charity of restaurant right. workers. Right. It doesn't right. Good exist. Good point. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense, David. Yeah. So it comes down to how do you have creativity? No, that's very interesting. When you said Grubhub, that kind of sparked a, a thought. I had that, oh, I was telling you about those communities of interest, the facilitation groups, and one of them was a marketing mm-hmm. group. And one of the people suggested that that is something that they've been doing as they were, uh, you know, doing Grubhub. That was something that they've been giving out, not only to their employees, but also to contractors and whatnot. And I really didn't put those two together that, you know, what you were really doing there was helping that restaurant industry. But I think that's a a great way to look at it. Yeah, it's recycling cash differently. We just did a virtual focus group, contractor focus group for a distributor. And we sent people lunch. We did the session from 11.30 to 1.30. And we sent them lunch to have during the session. And we just sent them DoorDash certificates. $25, let them yeah. order what they want. They could eat during. Some of them turned off their video. Mm-hmm. But normally, you know that from doing this with other clients, you would have brought customers into a room. You would have fed yep. them lunch or dinner, yep. said thank you for their input. Why shouldn't it be done if it's virtual? Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with you, Dave. I mean, that's actually a very good point. It's interesting. And it's something that I think that many distributors have overlooked. They just don't, they don't think about that, that there are still opportunities to do these activities and feed them because food is always a, a wonderful byproduct of those meetings. But why can't they do it from a virtual standpoint? And you're right, it's just creativity. Right. And it's appreciation because yeah. really- the food is just really appreciation for their mm-hmm. time. Definitely. It's saying thank you versus we just expect. All right. Now I'm going to have to feed them during my webinars. I'm Now I'm in trouble, David. Now you, now you got me in trouble here. So uh, going forward. Well, just make sure there's a client who's paying and it becomes part of their billable. There we go. <laughs> okay. I, I've got to remember the billable part. I got to remember the billable part. <laughs> These certificates are sponsored by XYZ Company. Right, right. There you go. There you go. So, hey, if we could switch gears here a little bit, one of the things that I've seen you uh, writing about lately is some acquisition opportunities or some ac- actually some moves in, oh, almost like shuffling branches is what it, it really sounds like. Could you tell me a, b- a little bit about what's what you see going on in some of this, you know, divestiture and then people are picking up these uh, locations and whatnot? Well, there's a couple of th- different things going on. Because the ones that you're specifically referencing, yeah. where uh, Shayla Yesco acquired a couple of branches from Rexel, yeah. and uh, Werner acquired a branch from Wesco, that was all about very, both of them were very specific mm-hmm. issues that tied to Rockwell. Mm-hmm. 
because Rockwell Automation has got some things going on within their distribution channel. For those who know about Rockwell, they have areas of primary responsibility. So a distributor has an exclusive territory. Mm -hmm. And they prefer contiguous mm -hmm. territories. And some of these locations were what I call an orphan. So they weren't contiguous to the parent company. Gotcha. So that Wesco Bogan, you know, Wesco owns a distributorship in Chicago called Eastco. Sheboygan was way off, not tied, can't get the support. So they're trying to do some of that cleanup. So that's what those specific ones were. However, we've talked to a number of private equity mm -hmm. companies who have all sorts of money, who are looking for acquisitions. We've talked to manufacturers who are looking for acquisitions. And some of these manufacturers are Wall mm -hmm. Street companies. Some of them are owned by private equity. Private equity has money to spend, and they are looking to help certain of their companies in markets, recognizing that some of this is COVID-inspired mm -hmm. downturn. So as someone looking at the COVID downturn slash the need of having to invest in technology or invest in equipment for onshoring, things mm -hmm. like that, are there opportunities? There are distributors who are doing the same thing. Now with the distributors, and this obviously changes somewhat by channel, there's the generational issues, there's the technology investment issues, there's the people issues. So a lot of that middle is quote unquote, I'll call mm -hmm. suspect in the sense of they're open to be purchased at the right price and they may have value for an acquirer to get into that mm -hmm. territory. Now, I also have people say, well, do you think industries are going to get really consolidated and all the small people are going to go away? And my response is no, because a lot of the small people, their businesses are really their jobs. And they own the property and things mm -hmm. like that. They may or may not have a kid involved, but what is the value for a bigger company acquiring a five, 10, $15 million distributorship, unless it's in a strategic area. Right. Because yeah. there's no infrastructure to leverage off of to really grow that. They're not buying a RDC, right. a CDC, a technology play. There's, there's not a strategic reason. So those guys will stay around. Mm -hmm. And I facetiously say, especially in the contractor world, if you're a one or two location place and you're servicing three to five counties, you might have 200, 300 customers and half of them you went to high school with. Right. So it's not as if you may need all the e-commerce capabilities because your friends are still going to give you X amount of dollars and you're making a nice yeah. living. There's nothing wrong with that as a business strategy because it fits that persona. But the bigger companies, bigger in the midsize, are looking for acquisitions mm -hmm. and a mid-size who's gone and put up an RDC or a CDC, sometimes he's looking for, all right, how do I pick up some of these smaller people? Because I want to drive more volume through the RDC, CDC. Yeah, yeah. He doesn't necessarily need the property. Interesting. So we see more of that and we see, like I said, on the manufacturers, private mm -hmm. equity money is out there. The big companies, the Wall Street companies, it's tough for them to achieve their Wall Street inspired goals, both upon sales growth or yeah. EPS growth. Therefore, what percent of their growth strategy is already allocated to acquisitions? Because they've already determined that. They're on the hunt. It's their way of having product innovation. It's a way of having diversification. It's their way of moving into a complementary product offering. And then it does create sometimes other issues for them downstream relative to their rep organization, sales organization, things like that. But at the senior management level, they're saying, all right, yeah. I need volume. Interesting. Yeah, I, I know that there's been a lot of you know smaller entities out there that have always had their back pocket exit strategy is private equity money. And I, I think sometimes it's a little foolhardy to believe that your little 
one to two location company, you know, and you're selling to your buddies that you went to high school with is going to be attractive to these companies. And they'll go to a conference and they'll hear all these acquisitions and they'll hear all these lofty, oh, uh, you know, multiples on uh, EBITDA or what, whatever the, the, you know, method is of valuing the company. And then all of a sudden, when it comes down to time to sell the business, there aren't as many suitors as they thought. And I think that's just, it's kind of a dangerous, uh, a dangerous game, you know, to kind of wait that long. Well, it's dangerous to wait. And if you're not selling to a strategic, if you're hoping for the PE firms, yes, you either need to be large enough so that you're gonna, they're really looking for an investment and they're already thinking how three to five years, maybe seven years, they're going to flip it to someone right. else. Right. And that someone else could be another private equity firm because there's levels. Or you have to have vision of where the business can go to multiple X times it. So it's something worthwhile for them to fund. There was just a deal in the electrical industry, a relatively small lighting distributor in New York City was acquired. Mm -hmm. A company called Chelsea Lighting. Mm -hmm. They're primarily a project okay. house. The next manufacturer joined them a couple of years ago. They were just bought by a PE firm. Mm -hmm. but their plan is to take that national. Got it. So there's a vision there. Now, how much the PE firm is going to have to invest for that? Are they going to do bolt-ons, things like that? Who knows? But it's a vision that the PE firm bought into. Gotcha. Yeah, it's just, it is, again, I see some of these folks expecting that golden parachute is going to be sitting out there waiting, and it's not. You know, and I think that that's something that right. these folks don't, you know, they don't really think through well enough. You know, David, something that you kind of mentioned, you're you're talking about, you know, in the, again, more manufacturing acquisition and whatnot, and you, you touched on the, the reps and the sales, that side of the fence there for a moment. And earlier this year, you uh, did a research project on the rep of the future. And if, could you share a little bit about what you saw out of that? And I thought, because I think that's really interesting. A lot of, um, if I look at the distribution channel, the whole vertical that the rep kind of gets this really funny role in there. They just, or it's almost like a forgotten role, I think sometimes. And it's interesting that you spent some time and really understood what that was going to look like in the future. And if you could speak to that and maybe how that's changed since your uh, study. Well, and it, it's interesting when we were all back in school, I think that was back when dirt was created. <laughs> Distribution wasn't even taught in school. None right. of us got into this business because we wanted to be in distribution nope. <laughs> out of school. So distribution's not, thought, not taught. The concept of what a rep even is yeah. was not taught. We knew that they were salespeople, but we assumed that they were all employees. Right. In most distribution industries, a very high percentage of companies and a sl slightly lower percentage of sales actually goes through third-party sales organizations, manufacturer reps, lighting agents, whatever mm -hmm. you want to term. And when you model out distribution channels in general, regardless of the industry, every industry has it. Because when you think of even like insurance, your local insurance agent is a rep. Yeah. Yeah. Because he has multiple lines and he's compensated on commission. Right. Now, we just don't necessarily think about that. So we did this study on behalf of uh, NEMRA, the National Electrical Manufacturer Rep Association. They basically do this every five years. We surveyed reps and manufacturers and distributors. We also conducted 70, 75 interviews just of reps and about another 30, 35 of manufacturers. Mm -hmm. So we got a lot of different input. NEMRA actually has a report on their website. But we overviewed where the current market is and the challenges. So, you know, we're talking, got feedback about consolidation at distributors, mm -hmm. at manufacturers, at reps, how the end user is changing and what their technical demands are and their technical requests and where they're reaching out to the role of where technology plays, the role of uh, product expertise, lots of different input. We then got input into, we even actually got into the issues of POS. 
Mm -hmm. point of sale and how important that is in the criteria to ensure where the rep will, whom the rep will support in the marketplace. Because obviously he's going to tie to who am I going to get paid for supporting? Not necessarily at the customer level, but at the zip code Mm -hmm. level. Because in contractor scenarios, a lot of distributors are hesitant to give up the crown jewels of the customer name. Absolutely. Sure. Yep. So we got into all of that type of stuff. What we came down to is we identified four or five traits of the rep of the future. The number one trait that manufacturers and reps saw that was key for their survival, and I purposely exclude distributors there for a sec, is demand generation, both from sales and marketing and focusing more and more on the end user slash influencer. Mm-hmm. Every SA influencer, it could be an engineer, an architect, where the product influence is going to come from. Because none of these people are really in sales, because none of them are really writing the order Mm -hmm. to take it off the street. They're trying to create brand preference. And the sales organization is really a component of the marketing organization because it's the human personification of the method. So they see that, and from a COVID viewpoint, we have seen agents do more in marketing in the last six months than they've done in the last 60 years in just creativity and coming up with ideas and executing. They need to improve on their sales skills and soft skills. And soft skills obviously even gets into using Microsoft Excel, stuff like that. The third area was investments in technology, both CRM, marketing automation, the equivalent of a rep ERP Mm -hmm. system for the larger ones, data analytics, yeah, and having clean data. They also need it for themselves for improving their own sales and commission reports. Now, if you represent 20 manufacturers, you're getting your sales and commission reports in 20 different formats. Inclusive of PDF and Word files and email. Yep. As, and as a business owner, think about taking all these inputs that come in throughout the month to aggregate it, to put into your own sales report, let alone take that information and filter it and parse it out to your salespeople so they can use it to call on their accounts. Yeah. So, Dave, I mean, do you see them uh, employing, you know, bringing in, and I, I hate to say younger people, but yeah. Younger people tend to have more ability, oh, to take those different data, you know, those different inputs and put them into a logical way. Do you see opportunities, I guess, in these rep firms for almost like a data analyst or a data cleanup person? In the larger firms, yes. Okay. The first thing, though, is for, let's say, a B, a C level agency. Mm-hmm. It's not nice to classify them as A, B, C, Ds, but yes, I know. In the B and Cs, in some cases, it's investing into the systems first to do it. And gotcha. as okay. one agent said to us, and he's a smaller agent, the cost mm-hmm. to invest in these things has come down dramatically because they're web based versus yeah. where they were five years ago. We had another agency principal said, I've already got five different technology systems. I've got CRM. I've got HubSpot. I've got a project management software. I've got my ER. He's saying, I need an IT person now. And he's large, getting, he's at the size he can afford it to manage all these things and integrate them because I don't know enough to integrate. So that skill sets for larger ones. The fourth area is that they see more and more need for product expertise and product specialists. Mm -hmm. It's less relationship selling. It's really being the manufacturer sales engineer in the field. Now, obviously they can't be for every manufacturer to that level. Right. But some distributors have invested in that level of specialists. Yeah. But for a number of the reps, if you've got a few lines in a certain type of category, it makes sense. Or if you've got some lines that are all in the utility space, you have a utility specialist. Right. right. Or you have a lighting specialist or an automation mm-hmm. specialist who brings becomes a champion for your organization in that focused area. 
And then the fifth area was they have to get better in planning, both on annual planning, account planning, and looking out over three and five years, as well as diversification, those type of things. And when we went into the research and haven't looked at prior Rep of the Future studies, we purposely wanted to look at this from a traits viewpoint so it would be appropriate regardless of size of agency. Mm -hmm. Because the prior one, prior Rep of the Future study that was done, basically said, if you don't consolidate, you're not going to be around. Which spurred consolidation. But as you know, there are multiple ways of growing. Yeah. Acquisition is not the only right. way. Right. So in the rep of the future, if you want to acquire, based upon what we see is going to happen over the next five years, and that's part of your plan, God bless yeah. you. If you don't want to expand your geographic area, but you want to grow and you want to get deeper or you want to diversify your product offering, that's part of your plan. So we wanted to lead them that way. Now, recently, and that report was put out in February, NEMRA gave it to all their members and manufacturers. They are selling it to anyone else who wants it. It's just off of their mm -hmm. website of uh, NEMRA.org. But we recently pulled together a group of manufacturers and reps because we're helping NEMRA with some of their strategic planning from a programming side. And we said, all right, before we get too much into the planning with COVID, it is what the rep of the future traits were still applicable? Mm -hmm. What's changed? And then we asked the follow-up question of what's sustainable? And after we went through it all, they said nothing's really changed except the time frame. We see these issues accelerating, and the feeling was about three years, because the challenge that a lot of manufacturers have, a lot of regional managers, national managers for manufacturers are not traveling, basically because of corporate mm -hmm. edict. The reps being local, they have more access to distributors. Distributors will see them whether it's in their building or outside the building. And users will see them, especially contractors, more difficult than the industrials, because what it comes down to is they know these people. The people are local, so it's not feeling as if you're bringing in the virus, potentially bringing in the virus from XYZ location right. yeah. or subjecting someone yeah. to a plane. It's friends knowing friends. The contractors and industrials will call when they have needs. It's kind of like becomes a symbiotic relationship within the local ecosystem mm -hmm. that they support each other. We're also hearing from distributors. They just as well work with manufacturers and regional people via Zoom and Teams versus having them come into the territory and take up four hours to a day of their time. Right, right versus an hour. So to a degree, COVID may become an excuse. So the new normal is going to be a merger of virtual mm -hmm. with local support. So the agents are becoming more and more important within the manufacturer sales funnel. And there are distributors who still won't let their salespeople go out mm -hmm. to call on customers. Part of it, in my opinion, is they're being run by legal because they're concerned about yeah. liabilities. I, I don't disagree with that at all, David. So we're seeing all this happening. We have seen share move because of agents being able to call on end customers and distributors versus factory direct mm -hmm. people not being able to. And it really comes down to just common sure. sense sure. of how you treat people and things like that. But all of these reps were saying it's that whole demand gen. And having the agent drive it. We have seen agents, as I said, do more marketing, do their own videos about product, do much more e-newsletters, do podcasts, mm -hmm. do outdoor counter days, do tailgate counter days, barbecues off their own tailgates. We've seen all sorts of 
different scenarios like that. I've seen some where they'll aggregate manufacturer training and reward customers for doing the training. Mm -hmm. Some of them are issuing CE, doing webinars for mm -hmm. customers. There's a group of customers in their area using their own database and issuing CEUs or running incentive programs or promotions, attend five webinars over the next 60 days and you get X. So the model's changing. We also know some manufacturers that had direct sales forces and some of them were moving towards reps early in the process and they continued mm -hmm. it. Some of them have, they're going from a fixed mo a fixed compensation model to a rep model because direct sales people were fixed expense. Right. And right. the rep model gives them an opportunity for more feet on the street and a variable expense. So we're seeing some of that being accelerated too with some name brand companies. You know, Dave, it's really interesting that you say that. I, gosh, it just seems like the, the pendulum swings one way than the other. All of a sudden, we're a pro rep for a while. These manufacturers become pro rep, and you start to see this proliferation yeah. of working with rep agencies. And then all of a sudden, you know, whether it's a, a new VP that came in or something changes, and all of a sudden, now we're going to go pro direct, and we're going to slash all the reps, and we're going to go this way. And, and gosh, it just, it seems to be a never-ending swing. It, the pendulum doesn't stick anywhere. That's the thing that's just so frustrating sometimes, especially if you are one of these reps caught in the middle of that. Yeah. You see the swing. What we're seeing more happening is companies go into a hybrid where they're going to a rep, but instead of adding regional managers, we're seeing some reallocation of funding from regional managers who can't travel. Do we need those roles or how is that regional manager role? changing mm -hmm. and hiring more local sales engineers to call on end users, EPCs, provide technical support right. to the rep and to the end user. And if they're not going to change the number of regional managers, they think about the T&E dollars that they're saving, mm -hmm. which is significant for a lot of these companies. Sure. And using that to hire the sales engineers, technical specialists, things like that. We know a large manufacturer that just uh, downsized his sales force in Florida. They convinced a rep agency who they were already strong with to open up in Florida. Mm -hmm. And that agency is now looking for people. So they had zero presence there before, right? supporting it with inside. But the factory has hired a couple of people to be technical sales mm -hmm. support specialists. And that was a way of changing your cost model for that state significantly. Yeah, interesting. And getting more feet on the street because remember, it goes back to the rep can get in front of the customer, whether right. it be the distributor or contractor or end user, whereas that direct guy can't. can't. Right. It, it makes perfect sense. I mean, I'm seeing. Yeah, I, I see your logic here. Well, I see where the response has been. So, no, it's interesting. And in some of these industries, you know, I'll use electrical specifically, they're talking about not getting back to 2019 revenue until 2023. Hmm. So the back and forth of where direct versus indirect based upon the health of the economy and the outlook will also yeah. play into some of this too long term, especially as more companies are owned by private equity. Mm -hmm. And Wall Yeah, Street. boy, you know, I think if I could going back towards where that rep is going to be in the future. And, you know, one of the things that you and I talked a little bit about this already, but the 30 day contract or the 30 day letter, you know, looking at that rep and just for clarification on that, that any any rep agent can be fired from a line in 30 days, you know, with this. And I'm going to say archaic draconian letter concept, you know, that I've always hated. I thought it was the dumbest thing I've ever heard of. But I think I would be a little fearful of investing, you know, making these investments here, especially if it's being driven by a company who may be prone to exercise that letter. True. But as an agency, you're looking at your basket of suppliers yeah, and your basket of revenue. And depending upon your industry, you might have 10 to 30 manufacturers. Yeah. If you're a lighting agent, you might have 50 manufacturers. So if someone does that, 
It's kind of like being in distribution. What percent of your sales do you want to have in your top customer? Right. Because he could go bankrupt. Right. So you've got to mitigate that in your planning process. There are times that reps, once they've proven themselves, they can negotiate longer term severance. There's some different models that have been used. Some of them can negotiate for 30 days away. I agree with you that the concept really doesn't make a lot of sense, but you got manufacturer people say, well, I'm an at-will employee, so what difference does it make? Why should they get any better? Yeah. But they're making investments to and building your brand. So there's arguments that can be made both ways. Mm -hmm. The better quality manufacturers typically will only implement that issue if they're really having performance issues and they've at least expressed it ahead of time mm -hmm. so that the agent kind of knows I'm on the bump. Just like you do with any employee if you're a right. good company, you have a performance review. You might put them on a 30, 60, 90 day plan. Things have to improve. If you're a manufacturer, you should be doing that with your reps. Mm -hmm. You owe it to them to treat, to manage them like an employee in that regards, because they are the face of your company yeah. in that footprint. And they will be there afterwards. So if you let them go and you treat them a certain way, they're still calling on that same customer just without you. Do you think they're not going to say something if they were treated poorly? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And honestly, from a, a distributor standpoint, you know, and I spent a lot of time on that side of the fence that we protected our good reps pretty heavily, you know, that if they were treated poorly by a, a, a manufacturer, that was the kiss of death for that manufacturer in our organization, you know, and we voted with our wallets and said, that isn't okay. Especially since many manufacturers' products are essentially commodities yeah. because you can buy from a comparable manufacturer, maybe doesn't have exactly the same brand, but the products do 90% of what the other guys does. Yeah. And that other 10% difference, most people never use. Right. That's a definition yeah. of a commodity. To me. Yeah. No, I think that you, you're right. And especially, I think the point is very well taken that now that access is really in the favor of the manufacturer's rep versus the direct person that access. This is where really, I mean, these folks are becoming in a position of strength and probably will be this way for, you know, at least 12 to 18 months. Right. And the issue on the distributor side is that if a distributor is not investing into the specialized resources, whether it's specialists, or the sales skills for their people to move beyond relationship selling and do some smile and dial and be of more value to the customer. What is the role of the distributor? It's relationship and fulfillment. Some are taking it to the next step. So they're providing value added to the customer as well as the manufacturer. But the manufacturer needs to control their own destiny and not put their whole livelihood in the hands of distribution. So they need their sales force, i.e. the reps, to call on that end customer themselves. Mm -hmm. Because it's no different than sending an email. We're just sending the human email to go and deliver the messaging. That's why I say a sales organization is part of marketing and the human personification of that messaging. Hmm. Interesting, interesting. So, David, I, I, mean, I hate to do this. I mean, I'm looking at the time here and uh, we've been going for a while here. I have to wrap up. Before I let you go, how can people get a hold of you if they want to either explore some of this a little further or engage your firm? How can they get a hold of you all? Well, they can either get a hold of us through our website, Channel Marketing Group, which is channelmkt.com. They can email me at dgordon at channelmkt.com. If they want to have a sense of our thought process and the various things we get involved in, either go to the Channel MKT site or go to electricaltrends.com. And quite frankly, you'll get a sense of our thought process because on yeah. electrical trends, we get into insights, observations, and information. Obviously, the information is more tied to the electrical, but we'll write about e-commerce. We'll write about pricing. We'll write about management, sales, you know, one of the postings from back in June was don't let a good pandemic go to waste. <laughs> yeah. 
there's opportunities for growing now. Absolutely. I would agree with you there. Well, hey, David, it's always a pleasure to catch up with you. You know, it's it's nice to to get to to share a little bit with you. And I hope that the, the business goes great in the future. Thanks. We're looking forward to it. All right. You take care. Thank you for listening. If you liked what you heard, consider hitting that subscribe button. Links to sponsors, products, and services mentioned during this episode can be found in the show description area on your podcast application or at www.distributiontalk.com. Distribution Talk is edited and mixed by Andrea Klunder and Edwin Ruiz at the Creative Imposter Studios. This episode was brought to you by my company, The Distribution Team. We are a consulting services firm dedicated to helping wholesale distribution clients remove barriers to profitability, generate wealth, and achieve personal goals. To learn more about how we can help your company succeed, check us out at www.thedistributionteam.com.